Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. This is episode 24 and I'm Andrea. And I'm Andrew. February has become wool month at the Fruity Knitting Podcast. Last week we featured an interview with fleece and fibre expert Deb Robeson. We're continuing with the topic today with our interview with Oliver Henry from Jamison and Smiths in Shetland, the Shetland Wool Brokers. Uh, Oliver Henry is well respected amongst knitters and spinners for his expertise and experience in classing and grading Shetland wool. So that's going to be a really exciting interview. We're staying in Shetland for our Knitters of the World segment where our guest today is Ella Gordon. Ella Gordon was patron of the Shetland Wool Week last year and is also a worker at at Jemison and Smith. Yes. We'll also be taking a quick hike around the surrounding hills of Heidelberg. Andrew has finished a project and he's making progress on his mother's shawl and I've got a new toy to show you today. Yep, so there's a lot coming up. Yes. We'll start off now with bring and brag for our finished objects. Yeah, and I've got a project here. So this is my completed pair of socks, Andrea, they're for you. Um, the socks are knitted in Lang Yarn. I can't remember, or we lost the, the band from the wall. I can't remember what colorway it was, but go off to Lang if you like the look of these and they've got lots of different colors pick your own the one thing that's a little bit interesting in these socks is that we did a bit of contouring or a bit of waist shaping on the socks yes so what I did all right you can hold there I can point what we did I started off on two and a half millimeter needles so most of it is on two and a half millimeter needles but around this area here so around the ankle and around the arch of the foot I went down to two and a quarter millimetre needles and the the aim behind this, a bit like hiking socks, is to make them a bit more snug around these two spots and just make sure that they stay still on your foot when you've got your hiking boots on. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to you doing a test walk on these, Andrea. (laughs) But I won't just wear these hiking. And what I love about my hiking socks is that although they're big and cosy, they don't slip off your foot because of this little bit of extra elastic here and here. So that's what I was trying to aim for. We're trying to reverse engineer that. Yes. (laughs) We haven't tried them on yet because I wanted them fresh for the podcast. So I'll look forward to doing that. And thank you very much. Two socks, yeah. So that's another jumper paid for. (laughs) It is. Although I think I'm still in debt. Yes. Yeah. All right. (laughs) Okay. So I'm going to show you uh, my finished object. And you might remember in the last episode, I promised that I would be sitting here wearing my newly sewn blouse, which I'm not doing. Here it is here. There's a little bit of a tragic story to this blouse. So I really love the material. It's a beautiful quality material. It's got a little bit of a stretch in it. I love the color. But as I was putting it on after each little bit of construction and going around to the family members and asking their opinion, I got a very lukewarm response always. First thing was that they told me it looked a little bit like an artist's smock. And the sleeves did have a lot of uh, flair in them, so I actually cut out quite a lot of volume in the sleeves. There was still a lukewarm response. Yeah, I thought that was okay. I just thought you needed to get your paints out and start doing a bit of, you know... (laughs) Not quite the look I was looking for. And then I was told that the neck just kind of didn't sit right. So this is a neck that has a little tie on the side. And I was told there was too much bulk. And it actually was double the length. So I cut down that. And I put on again. And in the nicest possible way, I was told that I look a little bit boxy in it. So I put in a tiny bit of waist shaping, although that's really not the style of the pattern. And, it, and finally, my daughter just said to me, Mum, it just doesn't suit your figure. So that was all quite sad. So I said, well, you try it on. <laughs> and she tried it on. You'll see a picture of her in it. And she looks pretty good in it and she likes it. So I said, OK, I'll give it to you, but please don't throw it in the back of your cupboard. Just promise me you'll wear it a few times. And she has. And so we took it down to the factory, which is just around the corner from our house. It's got some beautiful buildings there with brick, um, lovely bricks on it. And we did a little bit of a photo shoot. So there we go. It's a shame because I could have done with the blouse in this colour, but hopefully Madeline will wear it sometimes. We're going to move on to under construction. 
Uh, last week I told you that I hurt my arm and I had a complete break from knitting. I'm back to knitting now, but very, very slowly. So I'll show you my Catherine Parr again, but I've only made a very slow progress on it. You're making slow progress. Very. Okay. <laughs> it's testing my patience. But for new viewers, my project at the moment is the Catherine Parr by Alice Darmore. I'm knitting it for my daughter. It's in the Hebridean three ply. Um, so I've done the front and the back, as you can see. And I've already sewn it up. I used my trusty backstitch seaming method, which I spoke about in episode, episode 21, if you're interested. So the pattern on the body is this very simple cable pattern, all over uh, cable pattern. Uh, it's very easy to memorize. And then on the hems, the cuff and the neck, we've got this lovely um, two color stranded work pattern with some bo bobbles here. That's also easy to memorize and, and very simple. So it's worked flat in pieces and seamed up the side. So you do do a bit of purling with the ferrile, but it, if you want to try that out, this is a great project to do it because it's, it's pretty simple. It's only two colors and you can see the progression on the purl side easily of what the pattern is. So there's the front and the back sewn up together. I'm working on my sleeves, which I'll show you now. And they're on the most mammoth, whoops, <laughs> to poke Andrew's eyes out. Um, they're on the most mammoth pair of DPNs you've probably ever seen in your life. These are huge. This is like for knitting socks for elephants, I reckon. <laughs> it is. There you go. I'm going to speak about that very shortly. But here are my two sleeves. So you can see that they're also knitted in the flat, which is actually my favorite way to knit sleeves. I figured out that the reason why I don't like knitting socks so much is because they're in the round and they're small and I keep getting to the end of my row too quickly and then I have to rearrange my needles so you don't get a good long stretch of of rhythm happening. I think that's I think that's the basis of my dislike for sock knitting. So you find it easier to turn around on individual. Well, no, it no, just means DPNs, I've got you don't do anything, do you? In DPNs, you have to keep changing needles too. You might. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And same with magic loops. So whether I use do DPNs or magic loop, I'm still getting to the end of the row or the end of that section and then having to rearrange my needles. Whereas you can see, that's quite a lot of stitches to get through before you have to change your needles. And I like that. You just get into a motion. So that's why I think I like it. So there they are. Now, I'm sure you're dying to know what I'm doing with Mammoth DPNs. Mega DPN. <laughs> okay, so ever since I interviewed Donna Smith in September last year, I've been fascinated with the Shetland knitting belt and I've been wanting to get one. So I finally got one. I bought one, It um, ordered it from Jamieson and Smith in Shetland. It arrived very quickly. Here it is here. You've got different colors to, to choose from. And as you might notice the way I'm dressed, green is my favorite color. So when Andrew said, what color do you want? <laughs> when he was ordering it for me, I said, green. <laughs> there was some beautiful other colors. There was a lovely red and a lovely purple. Yep. But really, anyway, it's handmade out of lovely leather that smells fantastic. Mm -hmm. Really beautiful leather. And it's stuffed with horse hair. So if you've never seen one before, you typically wear them on your hip like this and you've got a long belt so you can wear them quite tightly and it stays quite tight to the body and then one of these long needles gets shoved in the hole at an angle that suits you. So that's why there's uh, so many holes. You can, And also I suppose if you've got different size holes, if you're using a, a bigger needle, you might make one of the holes a bit bigger so that would stay your four millimeter needle hole, whatever. But you can get these DPNs in different sizes. And, and uh, Donna, I emailed Donna Smith and she suggested I go for the 40 centimeter long one because I'm mainly a garment knitter and you want to be able to have a lot of stitches on them. So I did do that. Here they are. Um, it's, I've only got it yesterday, so it's a very, very new toy for me, and I've got a lot to learn. <laughs> it's a tool, though. Well, it's, it feels a bit like a toy. Yeah, it's because it's new. I've got Hazel Tyndall's uh, DVD where she shows you completely how to do a Fair Isle sweater and all of the techniques and constructions. And while she's knitting, she's using a knitting belt because she does 
use a knitting belt. If you've never heard of Hazel Tinder before, she's got the title of the world's fastest knitter. And she goes like the clackers. Yep. You, you, it's like we, we watched a little bit of this. She's like a machine. Yeah. Just going... Yeah. It's very fast and very small, very small efficient movements. movements. And I can see that. So let me, I'll show you what I can do. You, I'm absolute beginner. I We are going to the Edinburgh Yarn Festival and I'll be very excited to hopefully grab an expert uh, who can uh, sit down with me for 15 minutes and show me, refine my needle holding technique and help me a little bit. I'll do the best I can before that, but I think a lesson will serve me well. So let me show you how I've set things up. I've got both sleeves. I'm doing, I'm, I always do my sleeves two at a time because that means that I can do the um, increases at the same places on, on both sleeves. So if I, I forget to do an increase on one sleeve till a couple of rows too late, I do it the same on the other one and it really doesn't make a difference. The idea is that the, the knitting belt doesn't move and that your weight of your knitting sits here and you don't actually hold this. You might, um, lay, I think you can even lean your hand weight on it if you want to. And then you use the flicking motion with your finger or your finger's a little bit like a shuttle. It just goes back and forward. And I can't, I'm not fast now. And I, I think the way to practice is to practice slow and really watch what you're doing with your movements so you can refine it. And then gradually the speed will come. I think that's, that's my idea. Um, and I can see already that just with the knitting and, and the left hand sort of just moves back and forward like this. So in a sense, the left hand is working the stitches on and off the needle, whereas before I would hold my left hand probably pretty still and be working my right hand more actively. So this right hand needle just stays still and I just sort of, this is almost like a rocking movement, back and forth, back and forth. You see that? Mm -hmm. I think so. And then the third and, and, and finger and the thumb just pull these stitches down as you go. So I'm being very brave here. I hope you appreciate it. I'm knitting and talking with a new method. Yeah. <laughs> but I can see immediately that the knitting and the purling is going to be able to, you know, get a really good rhythm to it and be minimum movement and work very well. But I do cable without a cable needle and... Normally what I do for that is go around and pick one of, the needle, one of the stitches from here and I do that by moving like this and because this needle here is pretty rigid, that doesn't seem to be working well because then I have to stick this yeah, stick so, right out. So normally you're working at about right angles? I'm working, yeah, but, but I can move my hands. Yeah, but to do this cabling thing you, you need to bring the two needles in the same angle. Yeah. So I don't know, I don't know if, if Shetland knitters who use a belt cable without a cable needle. That's something I'd like to find out. When you think of Shetland knitting, you think of beautiful, beautiful, intricate lace and ferrule. I mean, Aaron is cables, but I don't, is that from yeah. Shetland or is that from other islands or I'm not sure. This is information I, I need to find out and I'm very keen to find out. So I hope to learn a little bit more when I'm at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival, but this is my new to toy and I will let you know how I go with my progress. While we're still on the Catherine Parr, I have had some people ask me how do I uh, do a cable without a cable needle and so I'm going to show you a very quick video, four minutes, of how I do it. Now. There's not a set way of cabling without a cable needle because there are so many different kinds of cables. But I'm going to show you very briefly the, the method that I use most regularly. And I have to say also the way I cable, I tend to favour knitting projects that have got fingering weight or light sports weight. Uh, so quite a, not a thick bulky yarn. And I also like patterns that are reasonably detailed and small, not really big and bulky. So for cabling, this cable, you only move one stitch at a time to the right or to the left, but you can get cables that are moving up to six stitches at a time. So you can use a different method for, you, for moving more stitches. 
I have done a tutorial on the Windy Scarf by Martin Story and that moves three stitches. So the cable is three stitches wide and I move that both to the right and to the left and then I have two three stitch cables crossing over each other and the stitches in between staying or behind the background stitches staying the same. So you have two cables crossing over some stitches that stay behind. And in that tutorial, I show you how to do it all with a cable needle, needle and then all again without a cable needle. So if you're really keen to learn how to cable without a cable needle, that's a really good tutorial to look at. What I've done in the notes underneath the YouTube video is there's headings. So you can click on a heading and go straight to a section that you want to see and that'll open up a new window and you can watch it. So that's easier for you. You don't have to plow through the whole long tutorial. So if you're interested, I suggest you have a look at that one. But coming up right now is just a four minute quick version of what I've done on this pattern. I'm going to show you how I cable without using a cable needle. This cabled pattern was designed by Alice Starmore and is based on the oak and plaster structure that you find in medieval buildings or Stockwerk as you say in German. It's a very easy pattern to cable without a cable needle because you only ever move one stitch across at a time. This pattern has the cable stitches moving both to the right and to the left so I can show you how to do both ways. So when you're starting a new cable pattern, try to understand logically where the stitches are meant to be moving to and how they're being moved. If you do understand what you're doing with your stitches, where they're meant to go and how, how they're being moved, then you'll memorize the pattern a lot quicker and then your whole cabling experience is going to be a lot more fun. So you see here on my left hand needle, I've got two columns of knit stitches. And on either side of these columns, I have a purl stitch. So I have a purl stitch there and a purl stitch there. What I have to do is move this knit stitch across the front of that purl stitch and have it on the right hand side. And this knit stitch has to be moved across the front of this purl stitch and have it on the left hand side. So in the end, I would have a knit stitch, two purl stitches and a knit stitch. And if you have a look down here, this is just a pattern repeat. This is where I am here, up here. So you can see that I had the two knit stitches here. These are the long columns of knit stitch. And on either side, I had a purl stitch. And then they were moved in between. And that's what forces the knit columns to go out. Okay, so that's what I'm aiming for up here. The, the knit stitches in cables are often the ones that are standing out and the, there'll often be a, a contrast pearl background which helps the cables pop out. So I have my, my working yarn at the front. I slip the pearl stitch on unworked to my right hand needle. The yarn goes back down to the back. I'm going to now knit this stitch I put the yarn to the front. Because I'm going to move the purl stitch behind the work, I'm not going to move it in front or it'll cover up this, this lovely long um, column of knit stitches. I have to move it behind. So my left hand needle goes behind and picks it up like that. I slide things to the end. There I am. Okay, so I knitted a purl stitch, I knitted the knit stitch, and now I'm up to, to knitting this purl stitch. So now we're going to move this knit stitch in front of that purl stitch, and that purl stitch is going to go behind. So we slip the knit stitch unworked onto the right hand needle, and now I'm going to purl this stitch. So I have to bring my working yarn back to the front again. I purl it. And now I need to bring this knit stitch 
to the left hand side of that purl stitch. So I put my needle point on the left hand needle point at the begin at the front of the work. I don't move it from behind, I move it from the front. And then I knit it. So we've got the knit stitch. That column is going to start going this direction. We've got two filler purl stitches and this column of knit stitches is now going to start going that direction. So that's very simple. I'll just do a couple more. So here we are. I slip the purl, I knit. There, I've just cabled that, that one to the right. I slip the knit, I purl. and I've just cabled that one to the left. Hello, my name's Elle Gordon and I'm a knitter from Shetland. Um, I've been knitting for about five years um, I studied textiles at college so I did a lot of machine knitting and that was really kind of what got me into knitting and after I left college I started working at Jimson Smith um, which is a wool producer, Shetland wool producer in Shetland and that's really got me back into my hand knitting. Um, I've done a few hand knit pattern designs um, so really it's I've kind of been inspired, well I am inspired by Shetland and the kind of the culture, the weather, um, the images and how Shetlanders put colours and patterns and different um, designs together. So I thought I'd share um, some pieces of my knitting and the first thing I thought I'd start with is my craft house hat. Um, this was my design for Shetland Wool Week 2016, so last year, and um, the idea is for Shetland Wool Week every year the patron, which I was last year, uh, designs a hat pattern which people make and wear when they come to Shetland. So this was my design for last year. So I, I used to make, I haven't <clears throat> been doing it so much lately for time. Um, I used to make cushions in the shape of craft houses, which is a traditional house um, shape in Shetland. I've actually got one over there, so I'll go and get it. So this is a craft house cushion that I used to make, and I put different um, doors and windows and things on them. So that was really my kind of inspiration for the hat, and I wanted to take something imagery that I was known for using and put it on my design. So it has a corrugated rib and then the house and then a crown pattern. So what I was trying to do was um, have kind of traditional Shetland skills and techniques but do something a little bit different. Um, the next thing is another one of my patterns which I uh, released I think about October time last year and it's the hap cowl. So it's inspired by traditional Shetland haps which are the square shawls with the wavy um, border and then they usually have a lacy edge in as well. And I have, I made one and I love it but I, I always, I often wear these like cowl scarves because in Shetland it's quite windy so it's quite good to have something that can't blow off. Um, so that's what I was inspired with with this design and you can see so it's just garter stitch and then the wavy border and what I liked most about it was the colours so putting the colours together and seeing how that came out so I was really pleased with with that design. Um, the next thing isn't my design I actually took the the pattern from a Japanese knitting book about Koichi knitting which is which is a a Canadian um, style of knitting which has quite um, strong kind of similarities to some Shetland styles of knitting. So it's a vest um, and the original 
pattern had teepees on it which I didn't really feel comfortable with having on my design so I swapped it out for craft houses and this is actually the first thing I knit with craft houses in it or on it I should say. So this I used two strands of iron weight yarn. I'm not a big purler if I can avoid it um, so I, but I actually did this back and forth um, because the because it was two strands of iron so it was like chunky weight it wasn't too bad to do the the pearl rolls back they went quite fast um but i love this vest and i wear it the whole time and i am um kind of working on a design for another vest like that um this piece is a kate davis puffin sweater which i've actually made um four of this was i think the fourth one i made no the third one i made and this is in the original colours um, and so this is in two ply jumper whip from my work and um, I machine knit the body and sleeves and then hand knit the yoke which is my favourite way to knit yokes um, and I just love it. I think it's so effective the way the pattern is and it really does look like a puffin's beak. This is one of my favourite things. And the last thing is a cardigan which is was designed by Helene Magnuson who's an Icelandic designer and it's um, called the Flower Pot Cardigan and it uses um, kind of Icelandic garter stitch intarsia. Um, so the cardigan has a kind of flower motif and then especially on the back. And it actually had sleeves um, which I took off not that long ago and I also added this um, kind of crochet binding around it. This is like one of the biggest things I've made and it was definitely a, a labour of love but it's so warm. It's knit in Alphos Lopi which is the uh, chunky weight Lopi and although it's, I mean it's Icelandic yarn so it's not soft but it's very very warm. So that's five of my um, favourite knitted items. Wasn't that such a beautiful picturesque scene at the end? Thank you Ella for braving the chilly Shetland wind and ocean spray so that we could enjoy that. Yep, yep. I really enjoyed seeing that. It's, it, I think it's really cool that we managed to get two generations of uh, Shetlanders on the show today. Um, Ella does also work at Jamison and Smith. She is their social media person. She maintains their blog. She gave us a lot of help in doing the interview with uh, Oliver Henry, which is coming up now. That was really helpful for us. Um, I think Ella also gets to do a bit of traveling with the company or to represent the company at different wool shows around the world. Yeah. Uh, I know she did get to go to uh, Vogue Knitting Live recently in New York. She had some pictures up on her Instagram feed and I got the feeling that she really enjoyed getting a bit of travel in like that. So I bet. Who that's wouldn't? That's really cool. Yeah. Yep. yeah. But speaking about different yarn festivals, as I mentioned, we're going to the Edinburgh Yarn Festival, which we're super excited about. Edinburgh is a beautiful city. We've never been before, so we're really going to look forward to seeing the city as well. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm really looking forward to that, just being in Scotland for... Yeah. Because yeah, I've never been you've there. Never you've never been to yeah, Scotland. Yeah, you've been there, but I never. I didn't come on the first yeah. trip that you did. Yeah, it was just Madeline and I. We yeah. went to Loch Lomond. Yeah, so um, I told some people at work and they asked me if I was going to get it killed. Yes. <laughs> I'm still a bit 
Good the problem is I've looked up your clan and you, there's so many gorgeous colours, but your clan is quite red and blue and, and traditional looking. And some of the, like when Madeline and I went, we went to the Highland Games yeah. and we saw all of these different clans in the in different bi, uh, bagpipe societies going around. And some yeah. of the colours, I was dying. They were just, well, and you're saying you don't like our clan <laughs> colours. We are the clan of the dog. We are the clan we of the dog. Here. We are That's the clan something of the to dog. be proud of. Yeah. We've got a bit of. <laughs> well, yeah, they're not what I would pick. They weren't. They were, I mean, it's they're a bit all what, lovely. It's a bit muted. No, I would like it more muted. It's very, very. Okay. I, although I think every clan does have a dress kilt and a um, a working kilt. I don't know what the opposite t- for a working. Maybe there's a war kilt and there's a, a dress war kilt. kilt. Right. <laughs> A kilt for going out and fighting in the mud yeah. and a kilt for dressing up and celebrating afterwards. Yeah, which we don't need. <laughs> anyway, your dr- the, your dress kilt is very red and blue and very traditional red, pillar box ready kind of. And I, I like, like some of the ones that I saw were muted greens, even with a little bit of purple in and, and, mm-hmm. and mustard and yellow, like gorgeous combinations. But... Um, yeah, so maybe you might have to go fremt <laughs> and take a take a kilt that's not your clan. Oh, that sounds terrible. That sounds Edinburgh. really terrible. Bad yeah. idea. But Edinburgh Yarn Festival, yes. Did you mention there's the podcaster lounge? Yes. Yeah, so we're going to be there. We're really happy to meet people. If you see us, come and say hello. There is a podcaster lounge which is being sponsored by Blacker Yarns, which is really cool. Knit British is organising that, so that's a really great effort on her part. Yeah. Um, we're going to be there. I think, what's the plan? We're going to be there between 1 and 2 p.m. Yeah. on Friday and Saturday. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's arranged so that podcasters and viewers can meet up together and the between 1 and 2 yep. on um, so yeah, Friday. So if you want to find us, seek us out or anyone else, yeah, everyone will be, well, I guess people will be in that space. Yeah. Um, it's, it's open. It's not like it's only for podcasters. It's for everyone to come in and say hello, so yeah. that would be fun. We're back on to under construction again and yeah. Andrew's got... His project is It's my turn now. This is my, which is the right side. I think this is the right side. I'll try to hold it up the right way. Yeah, that's the right side. This is my Drachenfels. All right, I looked up Drachenfels and Drachenfels. It's a pattern by Melanie Berg. Um, Drachenfels is actually a place in Germany up near Bonn, I believe. Um, I'll put in some, a little bit about the the stories around this area um, on the website on fruityknitting.com. But um, the pattern itself so I'm using the rosy green wool, which is also the recommended wool. I'll hold it for you. If it's you like. 100% merino. Um, washable. I'm making this for my mum. I mentioned it last week or last episode. It's really fun to do. I'm actually really enjoying it. The wool's really interesting because it's quite a, a sort of – it's a different sort of wool to what I've experienced. I haven't experienced a lot of things, so that's easy to do, have something different <laughs> for me. And there's little stitch um, – options things in here you can see there's little slip stitches and different things knit front back front and stuff like that that are new to me so that's really fun to do um it is quite easy there's a lot of simple knit stitches in there and often i mean generally what you have to do is a little bit of something at the beginning a little bit of something at the back and then it's an easy run in between so it kind of suits me quite well if you're a (laughs) beginner knitter Try something like this. It's it's really cool. Yeah, I think it's great because you get a little bit of you're changing colours, so you're doing. You've got a little taste of a lot of things, haven't you? Yeah, it's like a nice, easy step up from what I've been doing before. So it's cool. Yeah, and I think it's looking nice. It's looking really great. Manageable. It's Your mum's gonna love it. Yeah, I think she will. I think she will. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> We did have a bit of a catastrophe right before yeah, there here. Was, there was a little pause. I don't know if you noticed the sun go down. Um, that was because <laughs> I was knitting along. We've got these little spots here. You can see spot, spot, spot. And it was all looking good and I was really pleased with myself. But I was knitting back and um, there was something that looked a bit odd, which was actually okay. But just after the bit that looked odd but was okay, there were two stitches the same colour and that wasn't meant to be. Uh, that was a problem. So, so I just knitted them together because we had... Too many stitches. Yeah. Sometimes you can just cheat and do that. Yeah, but th- what I've learned out of that is I need to have a bit of bit of quality control and do some counting and that sort of stuff. Yeah. It's all cool. 
Yeah. So before we get to the interview, we're going to have a little bit of fresh air by going for a walk, a two minute walk in the hills which surround the beautiful city of Heidelberg. Heidelberg is about one hour's drive south of Frankfurt. So enjoy and we'll see you on the other side. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed seeing a little bit of Heidelberg. What you saw there with the lovely bridge over the river was the old section of the city, so the medieval section of the city and the castle on the hill. It's really beautiful. Yep, yep. Heidelberg's about an hour from Frankfurt, so it's an easy drive for us. Um, yeah. It is really beautiful. The area that we went walking around there is called the Philosopher's Way, so it's sort of up on the hill on the other side of the river um, looking down on the town, which is really beautiful. You saw the picture of the uh, castle there, which we'll have to visit sometime um, and do some we footage have. from there. We have. have we done footage from there? No. 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 Yeah. Yeah, I know we've been there. But we'll have to get some footage for everyone to see. Yes, we will. In so, the summer because they've got a lovely rose garden. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 And it's obviously a very popular spot with tourists and, and yes. there's a good university there too. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So we want to mention quickly the cabled garment carl is coming to a close. Many of you have done stunning garments and put beautiful photos up in the finished objects thread. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining the Carl. It's been lovely, very inspiring to look through all of those photos and see your beautiful garments. We want to encourage you to do your 20 second uh, uh, video selfage and upload it for the instructions. Just go to the finished object thread because we want to make a video collage, just a short one to celebrate your gorgeous work. So don't be shy. <laughs> You've already done gorgeous photos of yourself and, and doing a 20 second uh, selfie is only just a little step up from that and we love to show off your work on the video. Yep, get in with that, it's cool. We're now up to the interview with Oliver Henry. It was such a pleasure for me to be able to interview him. In Australia, we'd say he's rigidage, yep. and I suppose in Scotland, you'd say he's the real McCoy. But he's certainly a character. He's extremely well respected amongst uh, wool people in the UK. We did want to, to help you out a little bit because we do know that we've got viewers from all around the world, and some of you, English isn't your first language, and some and uh, Oliver's got a lovely thick Scottish accent. <laughs> which I enjoy listening to, but he does use some words that you may not have heard of 
even if you are an English speaker, but if you're not Scottish and you don't come from the UK, you may not have come across these words. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a definition now to help you out during the interview. So he does talk about croft. He uses the word croft or crofting. If you think of, just think of a small farm or, so it's used as a noun or a verb, croft or crofting is just a farm or farming. The next word he used, I had to look up and that's called a crew. And that's just the sheep pen that after you bring the sheep down from the hills and they're ready to be shorn, they're kept in a pen, a sheep pen, and that's called a crew. Um, he says kindly a few times and kindly just means very fine, soft wool. He talks about guard hair and guard hair is in reference for non-human mammal hair. So we don't have any guard hair. Maybe you do. I'm going back. <laughs> no. Okay, so guard hair is a, a sort of a longer, rougher hair that helps protect uh, the wool from abrasion and also I think it's got a little bit of waterproofness to it and so I think that's why when Deb Robson was talking about a Herdwick fleece being made into tweed that it keeps the mist off. That would be because there's guard hair yeah, in, okay. in that. Yeah. Okay, the next thing he says which I really love is judging the wool on the hoof. That's a cool expression. That's a super cool <laughs> expression, which basically means that he judges fleeces when they're still on the animal, so not after the fleece has been shorn off a sheep. Yeah. And then there's a staple side out. So when you've, got, when you've shorn a sheep, um, the fleece kind of sticks together and, when it's, and then it gets rolled up. And then when it's taken to the judge, it can be um, unrolled, uh, unrolled with the, the side of the wool that's been closest to the animal, the flesh side out for them to look at, or the staple side out, which is sort of the tippy bit. And apparently in Shetland, they judge it with the staple side yeah, out. Yeah, I thought that also referred to how they roll the, the fleeces. Yeah, maybe, maybe it does. And then two more words. He says, we bit. The word we means little. Mm -hmm. And um, and then piri, which is uh, also small or tiny. Yeah. So I hope that helps you out and you've got a few new words in your vocab. <laughs> yeah. I did want to give a quick mention to um, our Patreon campaign. We depend on the support of our patrons. So thank you very much to everyone who is a patron, particularly to those who have decided to become a patron and support us in the last couple of weeks. We are continuing to get to the point where we can consider the show sustainable. So that is really good. It is a lot of work to prepare this show, particularly with the interviews, um, Knitters of the World, that they take a lot more interview, a lot more effort than just the little bit where we sit on the couch. Um, we do need to get some financial support so that Andrea can cut back on her normal work. Um, I have to stop working, working weekends. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There is a bit of a routine in, in the evenings around here where I say, Andrea, are you going to finish soon? Are going to finish <laughs> soon? Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. If you do want to see the show continue, please do go and have a look at our Patreon page. You can find the link on our website or around the place that's underneath in the show notes. It's very flexible. It's no, no long-term commitment, so it's easy to do, yeah? Yeah, so and I basically just need to stop working on the weekends and the evenings, yeah. which I'm keen to do, but I need to be able to stop my main job to do that. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, but thank you very much to all of our viewers and I really hope that you will enjoy the interview coming up. You'll learn a lot. Before we say a final goodbye, we, as we said, we're going to the Edinburgh Yarn Festival. That's happening on the weekend that we were scheduled to uh, record episode 25. So episode 25 is going to come out a little bit later, but we'll have some lovely footage from the Edinburgh Yarn Festival. So enjoy the interview and we'll see you very soon. Yep. Thanks very much for being with us today and we'll see you in three weeks. Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. My guest today is a director and top wool man at the Jameson and Smith Wool Brokers in Lerwick, Shetland. 
Oliver Henry is a Shetlander, born and bred. He grew up in a fishing village, but spent his holidays on his uncle's crofting farm, where he learned about traditional crofting and sheep farming. Oliver is now a top wool classer, and around 80% of the wool produced by Shetland's crofting community comes through his hands, as he hand sorts the wool into grades. The finest wool become the Jameson and Smith yarns, and the lower grades are used for blankets, rugs, and carpets, so nothing is wasted. And most importantly, the profits go back to supporting the sheep, crofters, and cottage industries that have been part of the traditional Shetland life. And that's what's really important to Oliver. And I'm interested to hear more about this. So thank you, Oliver, for joining us and welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. Hi, nice to talk to you. Thanks for asking me to, to explain what we do here. That's a, a privilege to have you on the show. So let's start off with a brief background. What was it like to grow up in Shetland in the 60s? You spent your teenage years working in your uncle's farm where you learned about the crofting lifestyle. What was it that you loved so much about it that made you want to continue working with sheep? It was coming from a small island and then going to the hills in the north of Shetland. That was the wide open spaces, the freedom, uh, the camaraderie of the crofters, um, gathering the sheep. Uh, with a sheep dog I was given and it was just a completely different way of life. Uh, sea wasn't for me because uh, I was very seasick uh, even on uh, a fine day. Gathering in the sheep uh, with Glenn, the sheep dog I was given, I would uh, go with the Robertson lady of the croft to a certain point in the hill and then as if by magic, from all different parts of the hill, crofters would appear with their dogs. And the sheep would gather before them, and then it would be taken into what we call the crew, which is the pen, the sheep pen. And then the sheep would be taken out. And in the early years, there were none of these tags. It was, um, there would be an earmark where uh, a cut was in the ear. Uh, this was to identify each crofter's uh, animal. I recollect uh, one time that I was uh, shearing a sheep for the Robertson family that uh, another crofter uh, took, uh, could have been by accident, took one of the sheep I was to shear and when I talked to the chap in charge uh, of the gathering, uh, I said that I think that's one of my ones. And he said, just hold on. And he waited until the crofter, the neighbor, uh, sheared the sheep. And then he went and thanked him very much. <laughs> it was one last for me to do. <laughs> that's a great story. Shetland sheep breed, what's the, what's the history of the Shetland sheep? Um, tell us a little bit about that and also the characteristics of the sheep and the wool. Shetland sheep um, uh, has been around since Neolithic times. There was, a, according to the archaeologists, there was a primitive uh, uh, native Shetland sheep <clears throat> and this was like a soya type sheep. They found evidence in their digs, um, and they uh, were before the Vikings uh, settled. The Vikings, when they settled in uh, around the ninth century, they uh, brought their animals uh, over with them, and there would have been a crossbreeding that took place uh, between the two. And one of the first reports done in 1790 on, on Shetland sheep and wool uh, the reporter uh, said that there were two distinct breeds of Shetland sheep, a coarse wool breed and a kindly wool breed. That's a fine wool. Uh, the fine wool was used in uh, hand spinning by the crofter's wife into very fine lace, and that was knitted into the really... Uh, Top class garments that was sold to the local merchants and visiting Hanseatic merchants that came to buy the herring. Uh, two distinct types, as I said, there's uh, 
there's uh, a Scandinavian type with a with a guard here, a long guard here, similar to the Vilso and Spelso. Um, and it's got quite a strong guard here to run off the off the weather. Uh, but it is a soft under wool, not two coats, but two parts that is stable. Um, the kindly wool is a super fine, uh, is an exceptionally fine wool. Uh, and that's what people tend to try and breed for. Yes, because I've been reading The Shepherd's Life by James Rebanks, and he farms Herdwick in the Yorkshire Dales. And he talks a lot about how a high quality flock is developed over many years by introducing rams with certain qualities and characteristics. So, what kind of um, special traits are the uh, farmers of Shetland sheep trying to ensure continue or get stronger in breeding their Shetland flocks? Yeah, there's a society formed called the Shetland Flock Book Society. It was formed in 1926, especially uh, to protect uh, the kindly wool, that's the fine wool breed. And they, uh, they really specify that characteristics of the sheep has to be very important and the wool uh, exceptionally so I, I do the judging of the wool on the hoof and so they're looking for a very fine fibre, a very even and uniform staple and very important one of the main characteristics of Shetland wool is the superb soft handle um, and that sets it apart from a uh, would be imitation Shetland is this soft handle. And the soft handle also comes from the type of pasture. For instance, the fleece you can see here looks to be colored. This is off the peat and heather hills, and that lines to the fine breeding. Um, it, it lines itself to the, to the handle. They also feed on seaweed and the ebb tide and this gives them vital uh, nutrients uh, as well. So it all contributes to a good, a good uh, fleece. So Oliver, some people in the knitting community might be a little bit confused as to Jamieson and Shetland and Jamieson and Smith. So are the two companies connected in any way? No, there's, there's no connection other than, than the name. Jamieson is, is quite a, a common name in Shetland. And as you know, Shetland is a very pretty small uh, island community. Uh, for instance, there's a, bump, a bus company uh, called Jamison's. I recollect in my young years here, um, there was uh, two companies in textiles, Tullocks. Uh, and so this sort of thing ha happens. And uh, uh, that's just the way a life in a small community. Yes, everyone's sharing a lot of names. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oliver, you are a very well-respected wool classer. So I would love it if you could give us a little lesson on wool classing and perhaps even include a few definitions of typical terms used to describe wool. Wool classing, as, as you call it, is uh, what we call wool grading. And uh, you can see before you uh, the fleece here. Um, when a crofter presents his wool to us, uh, it has to be uh, rolled with the staple side out on the mainland, um, then it's the flesh side out. So in, in Shetland, it's very important that the staple is shown out. Shetland isn't in the wool marketing board, so we have our own uh, classing or grading standards. We have five grades of Shetland. <clears throat> the finest is super fine, and the reason for that is exceptionally fine fibre. It's very uniform. It's also very strong. And this is what we, uh, when we look back at that report, would be the kindly wool. So that is the top super fine and then we have the lower grade as i mentioned before two distinct breeds 
This resembles the Scandinavian types. Uh, what you had was the two animals working together, living on the same hill um, and interbreeding. And that's where you get uh, different classes of wool. It's a mixed quality. So we have here super fine, grade one. Grade one is still a very good wool, but it's starting to show a little bit of the guard here. The handle is not so good, still a fairly good Shetland fleece, but not so fine as the super fine. And just explain to the audience, what does handle mean? Handle is the softness. Uh, handle is, is vital. It's very important uh, in real Shetland uh, products uh, to have that handle. It, it is... Uh, to do with the breeding, uh, the fine uh, breeding, and also the the type of pasture uh, it's grazing on. And this is a very soft handle. Okay, so grade one is getting a bit woolier. The handle not so good. Grade two. You're starting to see a bit more of the guard here, and the staple is getting a bit what we call tippy. And just that little bit rougher again. And grade three, you can see that the guard here is more pronounced. It's still got a very good handle, as one would expect for Shetland sheep, but that is a bit heavier again. You can see the guard here. In grade four, we go back to that one. And that's that's a lot coarser. That's our bottom one. So super fine and good and the rough grade. A quick question, the rough grade, would that be for carpet? Yeah, that's uh, in 2008, um, we uh, we really couldn't get a, a market for this, and the real Shetland company uh, did arrange a, a carpet, and this makes a perfect carpet. It's got still keeps the handle, but it's got a very strong staple. And this in the past, Shetlanders there were no a use for this in, in the olden days, except for the ground, the base of the tattered rug. So what we have, if you can see here, we have a typical Shetland fleece, and this is the second stage of our operation, and this is what we're currently working on. You can see this here. It's got the guard here, and the guard here goes up the sides and the back, and then it comes up close to the neck and shoulders, and you can find that little bit super fine. This fleece here has to be hand sorted. Shetland must be hand sorted because if you had this rougher guard here, here you can see. If you have that and you put it in to a spinning batch, you're going to get a coarse uh, product out the other end. If you're making fine lace uh, or other fine yarns like we do, then you have to do hand sorting. And this is a job that I've been doing since 1967. It's a very skillful job, and I'm pleased to say we have two young people here uh, that can sort wool now. Does that mean that you can then make the most of that sheep? Because instead of making it all a lower class, you can get the fine wool out of it and and put the coarser wool for, for other use. Is that what's so good about being able to sort that or, or yeah, sort that particular fleece? That's correct. Um, it's, I'm going to sort this one just roughly so you have... The guard here, as you can see here, 
And so what we're doing um, is before 2008, uh, there was no real value for this type of wool. There was a value for, for the finer wools. But <clears throat> when the company changed hands in 2005, um, their idea was to turn uh, the Shetland wool into product. And this is something that we've done. Uh, for instance, this, uh, what we call coarse, and we shouldn't really call it coarse, but this lower grades um, were turned into carpets. And you can see the range of carpets here. And so what, what we're doing is adding value uh, to the wool clip. And this is something that we've been doing over the last uh, 10 years. Most of the sheep, <clears throat> Excuse me. Most of the sheep in Shetland is white, but there's um, not so many uh, of the coloured now. But you can see before you here, we've got a super fine coloured, and it's the same idea as the white wool. Um, it's got to have that super soft handle. That's our top grade, the super fine. And then we've got the middle grade, the colour, a wee bit of um, a guard hair appearing. But again, if we were to open this up, you'd see a mixture of, of the grades. The bottom grade, this here, is very similar to the Spelsau and Bilsau of Scandinavia. And it's something like the Icelandic and Faroese wools. And this is what goes in uh, to, the, to the carpets. And how does the brown wool dye? The brown wool, uh, this fleece here is Shetland Murat. It's a totally natural fleece. Uh, and this, this is, um, uh, no dye is needed for this. And this is the yarn here, Shetland Supreme. There's a woolen spun yarn, and it's actually... We have nine shades of uh, yarn, and we pick that out of the fleece. All, all the coloured sheep are different, um, and we have greys, as you can see here, blacks. So it's all dye-free, completely dye-free. There's no dye involved in this, and that makes a unique uh, product because one can never know uh, what's going to come out the other end when, when you grade it and sort it, the wool. That's beautiful. So what you're saying is just from one brown sheep, you get many different shades of, of brown. Yeah, you can. Uh, you, uh, there can be a variation of colour in, in, in a fleece. And in, in uh, times gone by, um, there's 33 different colour markings. Uh, some of them uh, have sadly uh, vanished, but there's five main colours. Uh, there's light murat. This is your, your sort of medium murat. So you have a brilliant palette of, of natural colours uh, to work from. Because um, we're hand sorting the wool, especially when it comes to the colour, you can get a variation. A, a color, then we're able to produce these undyed shades of yarn, um, and this in our heritage range. This is 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 the new heritage naturals, and uh, we're able to concentrate on on getting the correct. Uh, shade correct color yes and that leads me on to my next question because the shetland heritage yarn range is a replica of yarn that was found in uh fair isle and lace garments in the shetland museum and archives which sounds a really interesting story so tell us about the story behind the development of that yarn we work closely with um the shetland amenity trust and the shetland flock book society and we were, we were approached um, a few years ago, 2010, to help them out with 
uh, the revival of Shetland lace, and that was to produce a worsted yarn uh, to replicate the the, the hand spun a yarn that was used by our forefathers uh, in producing the, this fine lace. A couple of years later, they asked us um, if we could try and help them replicate uh, their heritage uh, collection. That's their garments that they're gifted from people in Shetland, like the Fair Isle. Um, they asked us if, if we could help and with our parent company, uh, Curtis Wool Direct, um, and the Worsted Mill, we were able to produce, uh, you can see before you, this is the heritage range, and this is typical of the, of the garments in, in the museum collection. That's a beautiful, beautiful colour, and it looks like it has a lovely drape to it. Yeah, that's that's a very good point because because the worsted yarn <clears throat> uh, does have very good tailoring qualities and it, it it drapes really well and this is totally different from a euro woolen spun which is a bit chunkier a bit bulkier this 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 is a very smooth yarn you can see the woolen spun this is natural. It's it's just that it's not a coarse handle, but it's it's a completely different feel from this, um, and this is your natural from this natural fleece you can see here. But this has been a very um, exciting uh, project working with the museum on the heritage because what you're doing is. You're going back to your strength and uh, in textiles, and that's like the revival of the worsted. Worsted is worsted, and we've um, with the museum, our parent company Curtis Wool, we've helped recreate uh, this tremendous um, product. And am I right in saying that some of these garments were found buried and? taken to the museum and uh, you've worked with some historians to to analyse that yarn and, and help re reproduce it? That's a very good point. Um, our, first, our first involvement with uh, the, the Shetland Museum and, and the cur textile curator, Carl Christensen, was um, they found the Gunnister Man. That's an area in the, uh, in the north of Shetland and this um, was the remains found in a peat bog and the garments were preserved and they asked us if we could identify the type of wool that, uh, that he was wearing. And over a three, four year period um, here at Jameson Smith, we, we identified uh, the yarn that was used uh, in his garments and this was recre recreated by the museum. The Gunnister man's garments weren't fair isle. They were just uh, a tweed looking effect. Um, it, it was a very exciting project to, to, to work on this. Um, and that was the start of, of our involvement with, with the, the Shetland Museum, which uh, is run by the Shetland Amenity Trust. And other projects um, that we've uh, been involved in with the community, with the museum, was the book of real Shetland yarns. That's real Shetland tales where textile uh, workers and crofters uh, told the story of uh, their experiences uh, in, in Shetland wool and Shetland sheep. This was uh, a, a project, again, with a parent company and uh, with a company called Vyspring, who are one of the main uh, users of Shetland wool uh, in, in their mattresses for their beds, high quality uh, handmade beds. That book you were talking about, I got for my birthday last year, and it's got some very good tales in it. That represents 
Croft and life in Shetland that I'm tried uh, to explain to you like I grew up in, in, in my uh, grandfather's Croft and knitting kept the family alive when it was rough weather and uh, there were no fishing, then it was your mom and your granny that kept uh, kept the, the clothes on your back. Um, so uh, yes, th that's that's very a uh, very good uh, example of Shetland Croft and uh, and and textiles. Um, one of the the other uh, and I'm most proud of this uh, project was. I was given an order in 2010 uh, to create a Shetland Wool Week. That's the campaign for wool. Uh, and that's uh, a, an international, um, what's the word, collaboration. In Shetland, uh, we had to have a Wool Week. I approached, again, the museum and the Shetland Flop Book Society, where I judged the wool on the hoof, and asked them both to help out with that project. And uh, it has been a huge success. It has uh, brought textile and crafting community together, uh, albeit for one week of the year. Yes, it sounds like a wonderful time. I, I was watching it closely last September. And that brings me to our final question. And that's um, Jamieson and Smith in a study. It was shown that um, Jamieson and Smith purchase over 80% of the wool produced in Shetland. So Jamieson and Smith really have a, an important role in sustaining Shetland's ancient but very fragile crofting industry. And this is an, a really important industry to you, Oliver. So just talk to us about it. Why is it important to keep this industry going? It's been a way of life and it's it's really in in the past and that was before the oil era uh, it was the mainstay of the islands the croft and uh, the knitting the, the there were many uh knitting uh manufacturers and so a lot of jobs in knitwear a lot of jobs in croft and when the oil era came in in the first of the 70s, um, the nutting took a, 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 a step backwards. Um, but what, what we're, we're seeing now uh, is a total downturn in, in the oil industry. It's, uh, it's, it's a global thing. It's starting to affect Shetland quite seriously now. So what you need is a very strong indigenous industries um, like your fishing and your nutting uh, needs a lot of support from our governments, uh, the UK government and the Scottish government. But this is vital to keep the young people in the islands. Um, this is something that in the 60s, uh, when I went away uh, and left Shetland to go to college, um, a lot of people like myself never came back, so it's vital that that we we keep our indigenous industries. We build on it to keep the young people in the islands, and we have to work hard to add value uh, to the Shetland. Uh, sheep. As an outsider, I absolutely would like to see it still exist, and it's such a direct link to to history. It's living history, and the products that are produced are so beautiful. So I think it's really important for people and knitters around the world to to be more aware of it and to be educated into what real Shetland wool is and the benefits of it. So thank you so much. It was wonderful to meet you and really fascinating to hear a little bit of the inside of the crofting industry in Shetland. Yeah, thank you for asking me and we'll keep uh, through Alice blogs and our marketing will keep uh, spreading the word and and hopefully that's going to help the, the crofter at the end of the day and also the nutter. Absolutely. So we'll say goodbye to the audience now and thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>